TV sound system, you know what it is, select a hype live and direct, you know what to do, like, comment, share and subscribe, this one, it's a big one, it's a massive one, this one I'm super gassed about, I kind of kept this one on the wraps, but I know that it kind of leaked out a little bit and I know that a lot of people are going to be extremely excited by the guest who is sitting in front of me, had to travel all the way down to London, it's a nice sunny day, it's been a glorious day and what a wicked, wicked way to wrap up the evening by talking to, wow, how am I going to do this introduction? <laughs> Legendary recording reggae artist from out of the UK. If he hasn't done it, it's not worth doing. The future is bright for him, he's still going touring around the world endlessly and effortlessly and he's sitting right here in his studio the man himself, the legend, living legend, Mr. Tipper Irie. How are you doing? I'm good, brother. I'm good. I'm good. I'm just um, relaxing today, taking it easy. Mm -hmm. I went to the gym. Okay. To a little treadmill, little swim. Mm -hmm. And now I'm back at, at the base, back at my studio, you know, just working as always. Is that is that like a typical Tipper Irie day away from the whole music thing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, normally I wake up, go for a little swim and then, you know, start my day. There's always something going on mm -hmm. in the office or, you know, I speak, to, wake up, I speak to my manager. She lets me know what's going on, what yeah. we got to do, what I need to remember to do. <laughs> You know what I mean? So, yeah, and that's mainly my day. And then I just chill evening, maybe watch a little football, watch a little TV, and then get back in the studio. It's nice having a studio at home because you can just okay. fall out of bed into work. <laughs> Straight into it. So, yeah, so that's me, man. I'm mm -hmm. just chill every day is music. Well, like you know I, I mean? said, thank you so much for uh, just taking the time out. For yes. um, hollering at me, I hollered at you, and you and you just respond was just super no quick. No problem, man. Regarding I'm, sound I'm about the music and for TV sound system. So once again, it's definitely, definitely a big honor. Let's. I'm not gonna go too far back. Okay. I, I, this is the very first time, people, that we are actually meeting. Um, we spoke briefly on the phone once. Okay. And I kind of deliberately kept it on WhatsApp messages or a voice note because okay. I didn't really want to talk to you over the phone okay. and banter and then come here. I wanted to just come and see the great man himself and just, Much just respect, man. plug in the camera, press record, hold a conversation. So it's not really a necessarily you. an interview. It's more yeah, of a conversation. conversation. All right. And I'm going to um, start it off because your career is massive. Mm -hmm. And for me, I'm going to give you my experience on when I first heard Tipper Irie. Yeah. i um, going to say shout out reaching out to my sister Sandra. She was at that time there buying the records there. She okay. Was the Lovers Rock. She's buying the, the reggae, the fashion recording label, okay. the green sleeves, all of that. Then she came back with one 12 inch. Okay. And the cover alone <laughs> had me captivated. See. It was a track, Complaint Neighbor. Okay. Now, if you remember, we're gonna put we're gonna put a picture of the cover up for the people okay. them to see. Um put yourself back into that position there at that mm. moment. Um, how were things for you, Tipper Irie, at that time? Well, I mean, obviously, as a young artist coming up, I just got um, signed mm -hmm. to Greensleeves. Okay. And, you know, the tune Complex Neighbor, I was kind of inspired from Smiley. Um, he done Police Officer. Yeah. So I just kind of wanted to do something similar, mm -hmm. but in a, from a different angle, different yeah. context. And obviously us growing up in South London and basically, you know, growing up in blues dances. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, we used to be stringing up sound, making a lot of noise Friday, mm -hmm. Saturday night. And then there used to be complaints, yeah. you know, complaints from the neighbors about the music, you know, black people playing their music. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously there was a lot of racial tension as well yeah. at that time for, for black people being in Britain, you know, um, what they call it, no Irish, no, no, dogs, no, no dogs, no, no blacks, no blacks yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? So it was them time there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for us, you know, so Complaint Neighbor just came about from that experience mm -hmm. of us playing our music loud and them complaining about it. Yeah. And I just thought, you know, that would be a good idea for a song. Um, song. I ran it by um, Chris Cracknell, who was um, head of A&R at Greensleeves at the time. Okay. And he loved the idea. So we just, I wrote the lyric. 
I actually performed it on TV. Um, there was a, a show called Black on Black. Yes. Back in the Vaguely day. Vaguely remember. Yeah. Vaguely and remember. yeah, I performed The Complaint Neighbor on that show as well. I think it's on, I think it's ITV. Did that not chart? Um, just in the reggae charts. Oh, okay. It didn't go into mm -hmm. the mainstream. It was just like Hello Darling went into the mainstream. Yeah. And then I did um, Hey Mama with the Black Eyed Peas yeah, yeah. that went into the mainstream. And then I did a, you know, you know I'm an Arsenal fan, mm -hmm. you know, up there you see the Emirates. Okay. <laughs> I'm talking to a Tottenham man. You know, but yeah, I, let him, I let him in, people. I let him in. But um, yeah, you know, we, so yeah, from there, I just basically, you know, um, I just basically just carried on, mm -hmm. carried on and, you know, the tune actually came out and it did okay. It got in, yeah. I think it got into the top 10 in the, in the reggae charts, Yeah, you know, but at that time, the, the song was just another experience of what I was going through yeah. at the time and, and not just me, black people on a whole. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of like the inspiration for the song. Yeah. Mm. And and since then, up until this present moment, I mean, like you said, you've got you've had so many hits. Yeah, hello, darling, the big song with the black eye, please. Which, yeah. to be honest, kind yeah. of went out of my head. Okay, <laughs> you just reminded yeah. me about yeah. that one. Yeah, During enough that work. Whole time with your career, mm. because it doesn't seem as though you've actually stopped. You seem no. to just been a being no. consistent, even though no. for some people consistent. it might be like. Oh, we haven't seen Tipper on the scene or something. Yeah, but well, that's I've the the done key. My research, I've seen yeah, I mean, that you've 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 been constantly. Yeah, that's the key. I mean, you got to um, try to reinvent yourself. You know, what I mean, not you know really reinvent your identity, but you got to. I try to just make music. Try to be versatile, mm -hmm. and obviously, you stay true to what you're used to or what you're good at. But then you got to also throw yourself out of the box yeah. and do. You know, I've worked with different people like The Bug, yeah. who's like a, you know, like a house kind of DJ. Yeah. And then I've worked with Charlie Tuna, who's from Jurassic Five, mm -hmm. which is like hip hop. And then obviously I worked with Will I Am, yeah. um, with Hey Mama. Yeah. And then there's the Lovers Rock artists like Peter Huntingale, Lloyd yeah. Brown, Winsome, Janet Kay, all these people. Yeah. How did those those international links come about? Uh, like the black. Well, Eyes sometimes it's just people con people just reaching out, mm -hmm. you know. And um, for the Black Eyed Peas tune, I was in um, America mm -hmm. and um, doing a little tour, a little tour um, with me and my band, and I was playing in San Diego um, the night when I got the call. But I was just floating around the West Coast, yeah. you know, just making links and doing shows. And um, there's this guy called Motivate, who's like a, um, a DJ. And I think he was Will I Am's DJ. Okay. So I think he used to DJ for them when um, when he did when they must have done their PAs or whatever. But anyway, I did a tune for him, and Will I Am must have heard the tune mm -hmm. and loved the tune. In fact, he, I think he was in the building when I was voicing the tune. Okay. And then he came by and said, who the hell is that guy? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And the brother said, that's Tipper Irie from England. He said, wow, he's dope. You know, I'm going to have something for him. So then they did Hey Mama mm -hmm. and they called me. I was in San Diego. I left from San Diego. I was staying in a place called Laverne, which is like east of LA. And then I got the call. So I went to check Will at mm -hmm. his studio. I think it's... I think it's a place called Glendale in um, in Los Angeles. Okay, and um, went there, listened to the tune, and I said I'll take it back to where I was staying and live with it for a night, and then come back and voice the next day. Mm -hmm. And so I just came back with cutie cutie, make sure you move your booty, shake that yeah. thing in the city I've seen, and hey shawty, know you wanna party, and the way your body looking make me really feel. And he loved it, you know what I mean. So straight away I just went in. Just, I was in there for about half an hour done. And, you know, he mixed it straight away. Very talented guy, mm -hmm. Will I Am. He just mixed it straight away and, uh, you know, told me what he was going to pay me uh -huh. and what percentage of the publishing he was going to give me. I said, cool. Yeah. And that was it. And then I just left because they, they were doing their, finishing up their album. And then, um, you know, there was no Where Is The Love Yet or yeah, Shut yeah, Up, yeah, Shut yeah. Up or none mm -hmm. of those tunes. So I just done it and you know, you just do a tune for a band and you know, they wasn't huge at the time. And then 
Where Is The Love became number one and then they yeah. just blew up from there. So I got the call, you know, to come to Hollywood to make the video. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up touring with them. Okay. Off of that tune, you know. I did mm -hmm. Glastonbury with them. We okay. opened, just went on just before Paul McCartney. And I, I opened the show, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? So what I did, what I used to do is do two songs before they come out. Okay. And I used to come out and do the two songs and then introduce the band. Mm -hmm. And then the second tune in the set would be Hey Mama, I'd do the tune and then leave. Okay. So that was, you know, amazing. And then, then I did a whole tour of Europe with them. You know, private plane, mm -hmm. this, that. They were op the opening for Britney Spears, Mary J. Blige, yeah. a lot of the rock bands. Mm -hmm. So it was a great, 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 Any great crazy opportunity. Stories? <laughs> well, there's, well there's, all, there's always crazy stories, but it's just what story to remember at this okay. time. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but, you know, it was just, a, it was just another experience mm -hmm. for me, brother. You yeah. know what I mean? So... You know, but yeah, but that was that, you know, the, that was Black Eyed Peas experience. Well, that was nice. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, but working, I just find it easy to work with people because yeah. I just do what I feel. And most of the time, if you feel it, that it comes, the song's not difficult to do yeah. for me. Has, you have know? you changed your way of songwriting from your early days yeah. to the present moment yeah. now? And how yeah. do you go about writing a song? How does it, yeah. is it a sit down, think about it process or is it an everyday situation that comes to mind? Um, what, how how do you well, do that? Well, back in the day, we I used to more write lyrics. You know, I would sit down, a topic will come into my head, and then I write the lyric. And then, if it's with the record label, I'd probably try to create something, um, something new, or something original. You know what I mean? Um, but if it's if it was like in the well, I guess most of the times the stuff might be independent or you know for a label, any which one of them, you know, you know, just make it happen. Mm -hmm. You know, well, massive is TV sound system selector hype live and direct. Tipper Irie is live and direct. We're looking around the room. We've seen the plaques <laughs> of them. Pure gold and platinum business <laughs> going on. Is yeah. there one if you had to just pick one of your favorites out of there? Which one? Kind of like means the most to you? Um, maybe Ragamuffin Girl uh -huh. um, that I done with Peter Huntingale. That was the number one tune for 1989. Okay. And um, it was the, you know, they voted the best tune of the year. Mm -hmm. So that's a tune that I did with Commander B and a guy called Flutie. Okay. And Peter Huntingale and myself and Fitzroy Blake. And yeah, so I think that tune there, is one of my treasures, you know what I mean? And but there's a lot of them, brother. So there's, there's there's a few and there's, there's a few a trophies few. and a few presentations. Yeah, um, there's a few. Definitely been putting in the works over the years. Because how many yeah. years has it been now? It must be about thirty-five years, man. Yeah, thirty-five and more. And how you have know? you seen the music change? Have you seen it change for the better? For the well, there's worse? there's swings and how roundabouts, you know. I mean, because of the internet, is I guess it's easier to reach people or more people mm -hmm. uh, in a short space of time. But um, I think, you know, back in the day where we used to sell vinyl, it was good. Because, mm -hmm. you you know, people used to go to the record shop and buy the tunes. And there was more of a, it was a marketplace where yeah. we could earn money quickly. Mm -hmm. Now with the streaming and what's going on now, it's, it, you know, it takes a lot longer time yeah. to make money. Unless you're, you know, getting millions yeah, of streams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? That. Um, is that something that you would prefer to go back to the, the vinyl days or are you happy to just work with the technology? Yeah, I mean, I, right you now? know, I just move with the technology because it's there and you have to kind of move with the time. Yeah. But I would prefer the vinyl days, yeah, because mm -hmm. we used to make more, much, much more money off the sales of yeah. the vinyl. But you're doing extremely well on social media, I have to say. Yeah. Is that all your own work or is that management or a team? Yeah, it's you? a team. It's a team. Yeah, because um, I'm noticing obviously, that you're very active. Yeah, myself and um, Amanda De Silva um, and Lynn Rossetto, yeah. you know, and then I've got Gavin, um, he's a great bass player actually, but he does my website. Okay. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, I've got a team of people yeah. that's just helping me out and, you know what I mean, I've got a good, good staff and good people around mm. me 
Um, I've got a good, you know, band as well. I work with the Uppercut Band. Yeah. And then I've got my own band as well, which with, with Horseman and Black Steel and some really good musicians. Yeah. So, yeah, I've got a good unit. Yeah. And a strong mm. fan base. Yes. Your fan yeah. base is absolutely crazy, man, because... Yeah. I did, I did Love a, them. Bit of, a bit of um, research before I was uh, before I came up here over the past couple of days. Yeah. And I've seen various places where, I mean, like just the other day, was it February, he was in Sheffield? Was it yes. in Sheffield? Yes, yes, And that crowd was... Yeah, it was nice. Oh, that crowd was going nuts. Yeah. And then I've seen you doing various vlogs uh, on your own YouTube channel. Yes. Showing all the different places around the world where you've been, which yeah. has been so many. We're Crazy. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But... um. What makes you think that your fans are so loyal to you? So, Well, I think I'm just, I guess it's an old kind of saying, but, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. I think I'm just true to me. You know, I'm a, I like to be funny, humorous, but I also like to educate people mm -hmm. and, you know, and give them, you know, something that, to inspire them. You know what I mean? So I used to do, you know, that's what I believe. And I think that's why people gravitate to my music and to me because I'm just keep it simple and humble and, you know, do unto others mm -hmm. as you like to be done unto yourself. You know what I mean? And and I think that's why they, they you know, they stick around. Mm -hmm. Where's where the places in the world? Because if I said to you, where, where, where are the places you played? You might as well ask you, where haven't you played? Because you'll yeah. be able to answer that better. Yeah. But where's, where, are you, where, where is the strong fan base around the world where you, you didn't expect to get that kind of Well, obviously, um, I have got a strong fan base in England. Mm -hmm. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Because even though the um, pandemic was on, mm -hmm. when things started to open up again, you know, obviously because of certain things, you know, you weren't traveling as much. Yeah. And I managed to get you know, a lot of shows at home in okay. the UK. Yeah. So, you know, so I know that wouldn't happen if the fan base wasn't strong here. Mm -hmm. So it, it turns out that, you know, it's it's been really good. But on a general, you know, I like, you know, a lot of the European countries, I get a good feedback and response from, you yeah. know, places like France, Germany, you know, all those, Italy, yeah. Spain, all these places. But, you know, I love everywhere, man. I've been to Thailand. You know, Thailand was interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, Africa. I went there with the Rough Cut Band. Mm -hmm. You know, and then um, India. I went there with the Reggae Rajas. Yeah. You know. Um, so it's, it's hard, you know. Singapore. There's so much places, man. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to kind of put a finger on... You know what I mean? Where the place. where the yeah. the majority are, but mm -hmm. it's just worldwide. And that that's a good thing as well because that just shows how balanced your fan base is. Yeah. Rather than answering and saying it's it's that, that is that particular place. No man, the music is the music is everywhere. You know what I mean? Because of the internet, music is everywhere. So mm. you got fans all over the place. Some places where you don't even expect, you know, but places like Mexico. Yeah. When I went there. I think that was the most pictures I ever took at a show where yeah. would by you know people queuing up to take a picture with yeah. you. So Mexico was nice too. You know what I'm saying? Brazil amazing out there as well. So you know, brother Does it take it does it take its toll on you traveling when when you No, nah, you yeah, got I mean, I'm not a party hard hard person, so okay. I just you know what I mean, you got to kind of balance yourself, mm. innit? So it's like you're at you're at work. So you kind of have as much as you're enjoying yourself. Because my work is enjoyment. Yeah. I love my work. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying. But as much as you're enjoying yourself, you know what I mean. You still got a no. So well, all right. Then I got a plane to catch tomorrow. Yeah. So after the show, I got to go to the hotel, get some rest, and then wake up the next day uh, to catch a flight. And then you check in in the hotel. You reach the hotel. You check in. You put down your stuff. You relax. Might get a little rest, get a shower, sleep, mm -hmm. and then you do the show. Okay. You know, and then after the show, it's the same thing again. You probably got a mix. Because when I used to go to Asia, I used to, um, you know, I would go to Bangkok. Okay. And I would fly into Bangkok and stay there for a couple of days and have that as my base. Mm -hmm. And then I would go to places like Pai, which is north of Thailand, and places like Chiang Mai, mm -hmm. Chiang Rai, and um, Pattaya, Pattaya, 
all these places and just do a little tour of that of that and okay. then I'd leave from there and go to Vietnam mm -hmm. and then from Vietnam to Cambodia then from Cambodia to the Philippines mm -hmm. Manila and those places like that and then just come back to Bangkok and then rest and then fly out mm -hmm. so once you go into an area if I get a one show in Thailand then I just notify all of the promoters yeah, in the area yeah, in the and the towns that deal with yeah. reggae that I'm going to be there. Uh -huh. And, you know, most of the time we can make, come to some agreement and do the show. So that's kind of like how I used to do it when I was traveling. And anywhere I am, that's what I would do. If I go to America, mm -hmm. I'd fly in, meet with the band, rehearse with the band, and then go on the road. Yeah. And so it was the same kind of thing. So I kind of got used to doing that. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's 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 ingrained. It does implant it into your your schedule. Well, you do well, see, now. that's a that's a lesson for some artists there mm. now. This right there, what they just got. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm just showing you what I did yeah. and what and sacrifices that you have to make. Because mm -hmm. um, when I was when I got the opportunity with the Black Eyed Peas, I was doing a show for 200 people at the Belly Up in San Diego. I think it was seven dollars to get in. Mm -hmm. I was staying at my friend's house. I just stayed at his house because I could go there and chill with him. Yeah. So I didn't need a hotel. So I stayed at my friend's, slept in his spare room, mm -hmm. and then I got a call from Will I Am. And, and if I wasn't there, I wouldn't have. They probably yeah. would have went with somebody else. But yeah. because I was there and I could deliver, yeah. it happened. So sometimes you just have to get up, make that move, and see and try to make your own yeah. luck. Because that opportunity is could literally just be around the corner. And yeah, it, it definitely was for you. Um, just recently, you've seen you spending some time in Jamaica. Yes, was that? Uh, it looked like a lot more uh, of a leisure kind of thing. Yeah. I didn't see that much music well, activity going on. But um, well, I did what was a little. Like over I there? did a little, but um, basically, we have a family home in Jamaica, mm -hmm. so I had to go because of the pandemic. I hadn't gone out there because I was stuck, stuck here. Yeah. Because of obvious reasons which we won't go into mm -hmm. but um so i had to it'd been two years that i not we'd not been to the property mm -hmm. so i had to go out there and tidy up the property paint the property bris bring it back to yeah, yeah. how it should look mm -hmm. so that's basically what my mission was mm -hmm. so i went there to do that and then uh, while i was there i went to king jammy's studio mm -hmm. and i met with the king and um done a couple of little demos with him okay down there in the studio and then um i did a dub plate for josh skins the guy from the, the skins that he came and visited me while i was in jamaica okay so i did a dub plate for him so that was the only bit of music that i did in mm -hmm. the whole month that i was there because my we got some land in a place called troy and that's where my dad's buried yeah so i went up there as well mm -hmm. to see my dad's grave and to clean it up and okay. and you know just just sit with him you know yeah, what i'm saying yeah, yeah, yeah. and um yeah i did that as well i was up there for maybe about five days in the country mm -hmm. so yeah it was really nice man and then i got to see a lot of my family my dad's on my dad's side on my mom's side so yeah it was a good holiday a good break did it give you did it give you the inspiration to play or make more music or create more music did yeah you, well did, like well it, that's what i do creative. i do that yeah it does then my last album living the dream it yeah. was written in jamaica okay at the house you know what i'm saying and then um this album now it's kind of the latest album is in well it's kind of i wrote this tune called i'm an african and i did it with um obf yeah. which is a sound system from france and you know, so the this new album is, you know, it's about more, I guess, more radical yeah. lyrics and talking about, you know, the, the pandemic, talking about bad mind people, talking about, uh, uh, you know, us as black men growing up in England and what we had to go through mm -hmm. growing up here. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, it was good. Joyce, I'm doing an interview. Okay, excuse me. And we'll leave that in as we'll well. Leave, we'll, <laughs> excuse me, but yeah. Um, and a, a thing I was going to say, I was going to intertwine with what you was just saying as well, because I always, if, if I ever get the chance to interview a fellow elder yeah. sound man or somebody in the music, especially who's from the UK, in them serious times there, yeah, you know, 
I've got two, three younger boys now. Yeah. Who's turning into grown men. Okay. Um, for you growing up in them times, at the seventies, the eighties, how bad was it as a as a young black man growing up? Um, well, it's not as bad as it was now. It's not. <laughs> I mean, but in a different way because yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, my dad was a hard working man. Mm. So my mum and my dad, you know, my mum was a, um, she was a chef. So she, she would, she would do, um, she would cook food at a school. Mm -hmm. And my dad, obviously, my dad was a shopkeeper. And on Friday and Saturday night, okay. he'd have the blues dance, he'd keep his blues dances as well. Mm. So, but tell me the, say the question again for me, please. Yeah, um, what was it like, basically? What kind of trials and tribulations that you go, did um, you go Well, through? yeah, as I was saying, as, you know, growing up, I mean, mm -hmm. to be honest, you know, for me, my dad was a disciplinarian. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't really, you know, it, I was basically, and we had the, uh, the corner shop. So basically, you know, I had to be doing my duties yeah. in the yard. Mm -hmm. So it's just basically study, go to school, play. I used to obviously do my sports at school and yeah. whatever, and then come home. Then I had to be in the shop, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And um, and look at helping my dad basically run the yeah. business. So for me, I kind of was more in the yard. Yeah, yeah. I would go to, <laughs> I would go to, um, we had like Marcus Lipton Youth Centre, okay. which is in Loughborough Junction. And mm -hmm. there was an adventure playground there. And then obviously, you know, I'd go there and you'd play pool and, you know, do the normal things. And then, you know, things would happen. Mm -hmm. You know, man disagree. But there's, so there's a little fights yeah. and little scuffles and mm -hmm. whatever. And then obviously, you know, we've been through a lot of things, some serious things, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? But um, for me, it was a tough time. Yeah. But, it, it, you know, it wasn't as tough. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? As it is now, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah, that, but how it is right now. Because we were more, insane. you know, there was, yes, there was arguments, there was fights and whatever, but you could walk where you want to walk. Yeah. If you're minding your own business, like some of these youths now, because of this postcode foolishness, what they're mm -hmm. dealing with, they can't just walk about freely yeah. like we could back in the day. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But obviously, at that time, our kind of fight was you know the national front mm. and the bmp and yeah. and people like that who we kind of had to look look out for literally, to, look, out look, for. literally look out mm. for you know what i mean but now they use them you know they're kind of doing it to themselves mm. a, f a film that came out babylon yeah would you say that was a f true representation of london in that time I say it was close, mm -hmm. you know, it was close. I mean, it was well put together and the sound system, the session with Shaka mm -hmm. was a true reflection of how yeah. it was at that time in at the dance hall, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So from that sense, you know, I'd have to have a look at the film again, really, <laughs> to be honest, but you know what I mean? Yeah, it was close to it. It was close. So how did your parents um, take you turn him around to say, yo, I'm going to be an MC. Music, I'm now. You know? Well, it was, it, it was their fault. You know what I mean? It was their fault because my dad had a sound system. Okay. You know what I mean? Called Musical Messiah. You know what I mean? And, um, so I basically grew up, you know, I grew up on, on a sound system because mm -hmm. my dad, every Friday and Saturday dances were going on in the basement of our, place we had like a free story place my we used to live on top and then we had the corner shop and then in the basement there was two rooms yeah and my dad turned the two rooms into you know blues dances yeah. so from a young age i just grew up with the music and then in the in the basement of um our place my dad used to re uh, rent the rehearsal rooms to bands okay you know what I'm saying? And so I used to go down there and watch the man them rehearse. Mm -hmm. So I was always being surrounded by music, man. And so it was kind of a thing that I just grew into. Mm -hmm. Do you think it was going to go to where it, where it reached? Where, you don't know. That's what I'm saying. Every step is just takes you mm -hmm. along the way and you just do what you feel is right yeah. for your next move. Because obviously I was on the, the sound system. Mm -hmm. And then from one sound system, you know, at the time we were just going around to any sound. Yeah. 
where we ever we can you know get ourselves out there yeah that's what we would do so we'd leave from that sound and go to another dance mm-hmm. and then if you know i'm linked up with king tubbies mm-hmm. and then from king tubbies it was saxon and then you know and then from there it went on to records mm-hmm. you know? we're going to touch on, on on saxon sound yeah what made them so dominating in that time because that's Saxon is a little bit before my era. Okay. When I came in, it was more like, it was Saxon. More juggling. But it was more on the juggling side. I kind of got Saxon World Clash, 94. Okay. Okay. That that was when I said, okay, Saxon. Okay. So previous to that, when I sit down with big man, they're going to say, yo, Saxon did that. Saxon did that. Yeah. You are you in Saxon? I mean Saxon mash up, this, and I'm like, wow, Saxon was dominated. What made what what? Because you was at, you was at the thick of it at that time as well. So yeah, can you kind of I break mean, down why why Saxon I, were so um, I, dominant? I mean, if you've got you got to remember, there's so much. It's like a gulf of talent. Mm. You know what I mean? So Muscle and Dennis Rowe, they would they would just from their see talent, they're just gonna grab. They're gonna reach out to them and say, "Come and come and work with us, or mm. come and come and DJ or sing on our sound," and that's basically what they did. So if you think you got Maxi Priest, mm-hmm. you got Roger Robin, yeah. you got Neville Morrison, you got B Candy that yeah. done that tune called "Meaning of Life" that mm-hmm. went to number one, you know, and then you've got Tipper Irie, you've got Daddy Colonel, Daddy Rusty, mm. Sandy. Um, Miss Irie, and then you've got people like Sugar Merchant, you know, Mikey McLean. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just like a load of talented people. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to clashes or whatever like that, mm-hmm. you know, we've got lyrics, you know, and Musled used to spend a lot of money on dub plates, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? And he also used to spend a lot of money on the sound yeah so if you put all of the elements together you know and then you had trevor sax yeah. who was like the real the person that drove everything that yeah. really kept everything together mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying it was trevor sax you know what i mean and then you had henry henry used to henry prento used to you know used to just basically eq the sound you know what i'm saying so you had all of those key elements mm. And that's why it was successful. And it was a it's a great success. It's still going on with big things now. Um, do you think you playing a part on Saxon? Yeah. Kind of, or has it stifled other sounds voicing you on dub? Because okay. if, if it comes to the UK sound systems right yeah. now, yeah. and I could talk to a lot of UK sounds, and I yeah. say, what do you think about Tipper Ivy? Tipper Badman, legendary. Yeah. I said, you got yeah. him on dub? Yeah. I mean, have him on dub, you know. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, <laughs> yeah, you rate well, the brother that much, yeah. but you don't have your money. But you know dog. what? And it's is that funny. because of your association with Saxon? I don't know. I don't know. That, but I mean, for happen. me, you know, I do a lot of dubs. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know? So it's like, you know, I, I've been doing a lot for a lot of the UK sounds now, mm-hmm. but, you know, there's thousands of sounds yeah. and DJs. Mm. So there's always, you know, you know, you get the odd sound from jamaica i've been working with a, a guy called papa lenny from bermuda mm-hmm. you know but and i'm running dub plate central right now okay. which is basically i'm doing dub plates with a whole load of, of different artists but you know it does stop it don't stop every day i'm here uh-huh. you know, I'm a, doing there, is a, there is a conversation going around on the internet right now yeah and the, 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 the basic question is yeah is sound clash culture dead yeah, that's what I'm hearing. I mean, if it's dead, they killed it, you know? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's only the people them in other thing that can kill the thing, yeah. you know what I mean? So the people them who claim to be, you know, the figureheads of this thing, mm-hmm. I want to kill the thing because, you know, even the other day I went out and I was, I went with um my missus and, um you know, it was a 60th birthday party. Yeah. And my brethren got this young, some young guys to play. Mm-hmm. So there were some PAs like Peter Spence, Bonito Star, Tenor Star, and a few other artists. You know, they did their thing. Yeah. 
and then after now it is just music <laughs> till the close. So if you're at a 60th birthday party, you know, you can't play 15 seconds of Natural Mystic yeah. or 15 seconds of Who the Cat Fit yeah. or, and you know, you got to play three minutes mm. of those kind of tunes because we're adults and we want to dance mm -hmm. with a woman. Yeah. You know, so it's like they haven't, some of them still haven't got mm -hmm. the sound training or, you know, mm -hmm. training what they need to really play at these kind of events. And that's what I'm talking about. You know, there's going to be a lot of selectors <laughs> listening who can take on board that exact same but situation. Tell me the question again. What do you remember the question that you yeah, asked? Is sound system culture dead? dead? Well, that's what I'm saying. They, you know, it's like, you know, and what I meant by that, sorry, I'll have to go back to what I just said. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because I just lost my train of thought. But if you, if you think about it, you know, they cut these dubs, mm -hmm. you know, and they might, I don't know, do two minutes or whatever. But then they're playing them for like, you know, 10 seconds. Yeah. And then complain on the cost of dubs. So <laughs> I don't understand. And that's why they, them, them kill it because the way they're, it's not entertaining. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a few of them that maybe can do it where it's really entertaining and yeah. you can get it. But a lot of the time it's boring. And so you're not, are you a fan of, do you, do you still follow sound class culture uh, at all? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, I will, you know, I, I'm a music person. Mm. So, you know, you kind of always try to have your finger on the pulse. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, um, so for me, I, I listen to everything. I listen to all different type of music. I listen to, um, you know, the new dance hall, just to listen, just mm -hmm. to hear what's going on. So I would listen to Skilly Bang and listen to Popcorn mm -hmm. and listen to, you know, but I like people like Assassin, you know, and, you know, so I listen to yeah. all the, the, the sides. <laughs> Are those artists that you would work with as well? If well, the if, they, if the opportunity well. came and it was right for me, mm. then yeah. Somebody like Assassin, yeah, it would be nice to work yeah. with somebody like him. Mm -hmm. Agent Sasko is a very good artist. He writes good lyrics. Mm -hmm. And um, and the new artist, Deb, you know, yeah. if it came along, then, you know, and it was right. But I'm not, I'm not going to just do a tune because it's a, certain, it's a particular person. Because yeah. if what they're doing is not me... I'm not going to do it. Yeah, it's not going to make You know what I'm sense. saying? So, you know, what them guys are really standing for, what they're feeding the youths them, mm -hmm. is not really what I'm about. Yeah. I so I don't really know if I would work with some of them. Okay. So we was just talking about is sound system culture dead? I want to ask you a question, right? And no, this is just my yeah. opinion. Yes. And I want you to give me, just elaborate on what you think of what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. So, Lovers Rock. Yeah. Kind of was the same scenario, Lovers Rock's dead. Okay. Would you say, could we say that the same people that was in it did kind of kill it? Because what, for me, what I'm trying to say is, when I see Lovers Rock, and I, heard, I watched the, the, the film, The Lovers Rock yeah, yeah. Story, and, yeah, all that, yeah, yeah. and I, I just felt like you Lovers felt Rock down. people kind of hogged it for themselves. Okay. In terms of like, if we look at reggae songs like a, a Bob Marley or yeah. Freddie McGregor or John Holt song. Yeah. Them songs get sung over again by Luciana, again but, by Cicela, yeah, yeah, again yeah. and again. It gets repetitive. Yeah, yeah. But the Lovers Rock songs, them, is like, yeah. it's like the artist them never wanted to let go of them and it just Ooh. stayed stagnant and it, I don't know. I, I, You're it just not feeling like it. It, it. Did it seem like they, would, they wanted to pass it on to the younger generation? It was more like a fruity thing and we had the elders them and... Mm. I, know, I don't know. But, I mean, I don't know. You I have mean, to tell because... No, I mean, I mean, well, I mean, I work with people like Peter Huntingale. Mm -hmm. Great, and, great artist, by the way. I'm yeah. not knocking any artists. Yeah, please. yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's just the kind of way how... Yeah, no, I'm just trying to think about with. how you've asked the question. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because at the end of the day, I mean, people make music and they try their best mm -hmm. to get their music out there the best that they can. Mm -hmm. But if, if maybe if the music was played a bit more... Mm -hmm on the radio yeah. it would help because if you look at stations like one extra or um capital extra yeah for instance mm -hmm. you know there's no there's none of the uk music 
and let, no reggae yeah. being played. Mm-hmm. It don't fit into their playlist, so yeah. they're not going to play it. Mm. So in that sense, a lot of those avenues, apart from the community stations like the pirate stations or yeah. whatever, the mainstream avenues have not really accepted that music, mm. you know what I'm saying, for it to really resonate with the youth then. You know what I'm saying? So all these things as a part to play, I think, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't think, you know, they want to hold on to it. I mean, obviously they just make the music, you put it out there, it's done what it's done back in the day and now, you know, it's moved on. Yeah. But if people don't, if you don't get no play, you don't get no say. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. True thing still. I mean, yeah, because I'm trying to, I'm still trying to, figure out the question <laughs> but i know I what you're saying but liked, you're, it's like liked. you're saying that they've they're keeping it for themselves or they maybe it just hasn't risen because there is a market yeah for it mm-hmm. and there's a market they have their their market mm-hmm. so it's either you're into it or, or you're not. not yeah you know what i'm saying so it's, and it's the same with dancehall some people can't stand dancehall true some people you know want to hear Berries and Coco T and mm. Freddie McGregor and, and Lucci, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Some people want to hear Skilly Bang, uh-huh. Popcorn, you know, Massacre, yeah, 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 yeah. all these guys, uh-huh. which is more the younger audience. But I just feel, you know, for me, if them youths were speaking something more positive and more uplifting mm. for, their, for their younger core audience, it would it would be more beneficial for us. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But that. what are they really talking about? Mm. You know what I'm saying? For me, it's, you know, it's not good that that's what the youths, them, they're feeding the youths. Them mm-hmm. that. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And I, if, I, if I chat a lyric like I'm an African, you know, and you're really telling the youths them about what's going on in England and, and what we face as black people. Yeah. Them tunes they don't get played on the radio. How frustrating is that for you? Well, it's frustrating because I know the tune that I done with OBF, I'm an African. That tune should be played on ra- every radio station where uh-huh. there's urban music. Yeah, it should be played every day so that the black youths them in the UK can listen to something that is gonna inspire them and say, you know what, you know. I, I wanna I don't wanna just be doing what I'm doing. I wanna be I wanna be like Stormzy. I mm-hmm. wanna be like, you know, be a doctor, a lawyer, yeah. or they wanna inspire to to something so, good. So how hard is it to get a song like that played now? Is it a case of have you offered well the certain DJs who are up there yeah, doing I mean, reggae well, shows? My, well the the out you know, it's the tunes come out there and mm. you know, obviously there's a you have a mailing list. Yeah. and you mail it out to them mm-hmm. but a lot of the time music moves so far so they're getting all of this music for a load of music uh-huh. you know what i'm saying so if it doesn't get picked up you know by i don't know target or one of these guys and they get yeah. it on the playlist mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying then you know it's hard for you to really resonate unless you have that funding to put put it everywhere yeah you know what i mean and it's difficult for us you know I don't know, to, to spend 30, 40,000 or whatever on a really nice video because the funding from for our music, it's just not there. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. we, you know, obviously we generate a certain amount of funds, but for us it's difficult to just invest all in one tune. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then if it doesn't, <laughs> don't make it yeah, then yeah, you're back yeah. to you're kind back of square, square one, one. Yeah, you know what i'm saying so you kind of have to balance it out mm-hmm. and put it out there promote it the best you can spend what budget you can on it to get to try to get it to as much people as possible mm-hmm. and then see where it takes you it's just like if a tune's gonna take after a while you're gonna know because yeah. the djs them are gonna want to play it mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying but it's getting it on the stations that make you make money when they play you. Okay. So we're still here. Tipper Irie is live and direct. Yes, my brother. About, like I said, it's not, a, it's not an interview. It's a, a conversation. conversation. It's just yeah. sitting down. And as you're talking, things are just coming to mind. I never had yeah. no set thing. All my interviews are always top of the head. Yeah. Uh, just recently, we had the 
Grammy Awards taking place. Yes. Uh, a reggae band by the name of Soldier. Soldier. Yeah, they won. Them guys from, the, I think they're from California, right? Um, I believe so. Yeah. Uh, which is a white, predominantly white reggae band. Yeah. Um, social media and the internet was on in uproar saying, mm. who are these guys? No, but a lot of people are claiming that they've never heard of them. Yeah. Uh, why did they get it? And so and so, so forth, mm. so forth. What's your take on it? Have you heard of Soldier? Have you heard their yeah, music? Yeah, I've heard for them. There's a lot. They're part of like a, a scene out in California there. Mm. Um, it's like a Cali, it's called Cali Roots. You know what I mean? Okay. That kind of scene. So you have bands like Slightly Stupid, um, Pepper, I believe, um, Soldier, you know, um, Tribal Seeds, all these kind of groups. And they and Revolution is another big one, mm -hmm. you know, and they're doing very well on that side of um, America. Mm -hmm. You know, what I mean, they've got a, in fact, they tour all over America and they've got a huge following. Yeah. So, you know, and they're making their brand of reggae music. Collie Buds um, is an artist that I like as well. And yeah. he is very popular over that side okay. as well. He does a lot of their shows out there. Um, Pato Banton's living out there as well. Yeah, yeah. So there's that scene out there, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, they're doing well. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, obviously the album comes out. It's got a <laughs> chance like Jesse, my brethren, Jesse Royal, another yeah. nice brother. You know what I mean? I got respect for Jesse Royal and um, I think Spice. Spice was up for one. I think Sean Paul. Was and Sean, Sean Paul, Paul was too, for yeah. Well. And um, yeah. So, you know, and, and they gave it to Soldier. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I mean, at the end of the day, everybody's in it to win it. Yeah. And, you know, not, you know, I, I mean, you know, there's a lot of white bands now that's doing pretty well, you know. Yeah. And, you know, and some of them are making good music. So if if they if the academy wants to give it to them because yeah. they believe that their album is the best, then mm -hmm. it's, it's their well, award. Is, Gram is, is Grammy something that you? Well, I've been nominated okay. for one for okay. the tune that I did with hey, with Black Eyed Peas. Okay, it's up there on the wall there. Okay, you know what I'm saying. So, oh, so you can't you know you know go fight against the Grammys. No, I'm not. I'm not fighting. It's not even that I'm not fighting against them. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, that's just an award mm -hmm. from you know that organization that wants to give out awards. I mean, me personally think that we should have our own awards. Yeah. I still feel happy. I got the Black Music History yes. Day Achievement Award over there, wow. and I'm as happy as that uh -huh. about that. What I received from here. And over here, I got this. I got this from Stereograph. You know, wow. this I got this from Stereograph. Stereograph Foundation Platinum Artist Award presented to Tipper Ari for outstanding um, commitment and achievements in the reggae industry worldwide, from 1996 to present. From wow. from the Minister of Michael Gordon, the founder and CEO of SGF. Mm -hmm. yeah and this means as much to me than any grammy you know what yeah. i mean a stereograph sounds one of the sounds them that, that i used to um you know i used to go to their dick shepherd school okay and listen to them play and mm -hmm. saxon kind of model off of this sound as well stereograph okay chaba you know what i mean so that's amazing. There's man. loads of awards there. Oh, there's loads of them. Lots of highlights throughout your career. Yeah, you, haven't, man. you haven't even slowing. You're not, there's no plans of you slowing down. No, so, man. I've got a so new what's, album and a yeah, new well, book. I was just about to say, what's coming? Oh. Well, I, um, my album is called I'm an African. Mm -hmm. um, I have got a young lady called Shanice, who's a beautiful singer. She works with Prince Fatty. Yeah. Um, is another good producer um, on the album. How many tracks? Um, it's 14 tracks. Okay. You know, um, I've got, who else have I got on this album? Apache Indian. Okay. Um, China Black. Mm -hmm. um, Errol from um, Errol Reed. And um, yeah, the, um, Friendly Fire Band. And um, yeah, so I got about 14 tracks. I'm okay. gonna, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna release. It's a nice um, package, man. Yeah, man. Mm. I'm an African. Got some nice tunes on there. And when's the release date for that? Um, hopefully July. Okay. Yeah, I'm that's when it's gonna come out. Mm -hmm. Um, I got and I've made the first video. 
but I'm just obviously holding the video until the album is all ready. Yeah. And then I'm going to put out the I'm an African video. Mm -hmm. So, and then I'm working on my book. Yeah. Which is called, it's good to have the feeling you're the best. Yeah. And um, that should be out <laughs> like for that. Black History Month. Okay. In October. October. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, my autobiography. How are you finding that? Because writing a book and writing lyrics was completely different. Two, two different things, it's a long it? process, man. It's a mm. long process because obviously I've had a long career. Yeah. So I have to kind of cut down. There's still probably a lot of things that I've missed yeah. that I've not even put into the book. And we're still adding things to it, even though it's supposed to be done. Um, some more came in today. So, um, yeah. So the book is interesting. So I've linked up, obviously, with a ghostwriter. Okay. And we're just doing interviews, 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 interviews. And then we've put it together. It's about eight chapters, you know. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, it's good. It's good. I'm really looking forward to it. It's yeah, got, my, obviously, be... my young years. Mm -hmm. And then the sax, a little bit of Saxon years. And then black, you know, fame. What, yeah. you know, what, what was it like to become famous? Uh -huh. And then it's a lot of information in there as well. A lot of... Um, because obviously, like you say, you know, we've been talking about growing up in Britain. Yeah. And so there's there's things also in the book about what was going on mm -hmm. in Britain yeah. when I was growing up. Okay. So, yeah, uh, people should look forward to it, man. That's going to be a fantastic read, man. Because, yes, I mean, man. this is the reason why we're doing all these things right now. Yeah. It's documenting history because... If we, don't, if we don't, if we document don't document it, it, yeah, we, for real. we have it, especially with our culture, sound system culture, and and reggae culture. There are books out there. There is, but but yeah. we still got to keep these documentations. That's right. Keep these That's things right. going because um, they'll be a light. They'll be there when we're gone. One hundred percent, man. So, um, tour days. I've seen a, a lot of festivals. This yeah, year. yeah. A lot of the festivals. How's the, how mm. do you find the festival runs compared to a normal? Um, a normal event or would you say a normal festivals are wonderful man you know from you know with me i'm playing at the jubilation festival yeah at brocco park mm -hmm. with my band so i'm looking forward to that and um you know when you can go out as an artist and you can go out with a team of people and really present your music there's mm -hmm. nothing better than that you know because sometimes because of budget or whatever we have to cut corners or yeah. we can't really present ourselves the way that we want to but now i'm just trying to stop you know shortchanging yeah. myself okay you know and the people i just want to go out with my band and then present my show and hopefully people will enjoy it but i love the festival circuit is the best time of year for me because i'm busy mm -hmm. you know i'm active and up and down and doing shows yeah yeah, sorry about that, guys. No problem, no problem. Well, like I said, I want to say thank you for taking the time out. It's been yes, my brother. Close to an hour. Well, what we're we going to do, I want, I'm going to, you know, anyway, I want you to watch this because mm -hmm. I still think we can do it better. Okay. Yeah, so I'm just saying, we'll, we'll, we'll roll and see what you how, what you make of this. Uh -huh. And then obviously, if we'll, we'll have a look at it together. Okay. And, you know, because I think we can do it better. You, okay. caught, you caught me off, guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so once again, Tipper Ivy, thank you so much for taking the time out. No Bless. respect each and every time. TV Sound System, Selector Hype, we're out, one, and you may see us again. I guess. For part two. Proper two. <laughs> All right, Bless. Respect, every part time. Part two, respect.